little cannon size. Okay. Are you ready? So, we're gonna do one, two. You do one, two, three. Okay, it's after three. <laughs> no, it's on. One, it can't be on three because okay. I'm saying after number three. three. One, two, three. Welcome, Welcome to, to Muay Thai. First bones. one we think maybe is the best one. Usually we talk about technique in Muay Thai towards the end of the podcast, but maybe we're going to start with technique conversation in the first part. Um, what we're, what we find very interesting is that Sylvie's experienced a kind of like explosion in clinch vocabulary. I don't think it's an explosion. It's like an awakening. Okay, tell me the tell me what an awakening feels like, or what we're talking about in terms of an awakening. Well, you were comparing it to like a Rosetta Stone type of thing, which is that once you get the key to understanding things, all of a sudden you can read everything. Well, what's the Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone was a, a stone uh, that contained languages that had not previously been uh, translatable. Okay. And once they broke the language code, suddenly lots and lots of texts ancient texts were readable. were readable. Yeah. And it was a huge thing because it just opened up a culture of writing. So right. why are we but comparing clinch to the writing? The reason it's like an awakening like that is the texts were already there, you just couldn't read them. Mm. Whereas an explosion is kind of this like an explosion in population or an explosion in... It, it's like this sudden expanse. Right. And I don't think that my expansion was sudden. I think it was already there. But my ability to access it well, okay, so we'll, has been very maybe let's recent. Let's dig into like what are we talking what are we talking about? Like what has increased? I'm a clinch fighter for people who don't know me. And if you don't know me, I don't know why you're watching this. Uh, maybe <laughs> people are just finding out about you. I'm a clinch fighter. Uh, I've been very dedicated to practicing, learning, developing clinch for at least five years, one of the reasons we moved to Pattaya from Chiang Mai was because I could not learn clinch up in the north. Mm. Um, and I've been getting a lot of hours in the pool, so to speak, like just spending time in the water. Uh, but I wasn't able to kind of bring experimentation into even the learning process. And then the experimentation that I could bring into the learning process okay. as I got stronger and better, I couldn't bring into the ring with me. But very recently, um, my clinch vocabulary has suddenly, uh, it's like your, your four-year-old had like a 20-word vocabulary and then next week she's like totally telling you the entire story of Alice in Wonderland with vocabulary you did not know she had. Totally. It's like, where did that come from? It's and, very sudden. And as some backdrop for people who are just not that familiar with your story, why, why pursuing clinch? Why becoming a clinch fighter in the first place? It's a kind of interesting little side story. If you would l allow me to, like, let's take a little loop around on this. Yeah. Um, you're a very physically small fighter, and. Uh, as you came to Muay Thai, uh, because you were small, you were told by many knowledgeable people that you should be a little like evasive, hop around, don't hit me, hit and don't be hit, fighter. Be Demetrius Johnson, basically. Yes, but with Muay Thai, which yeah. he doesn't, he's not really a Muay Thai fighter, but in the Muay Thai world, this was really thought of as like, this is how women should fight, this is how small people should fight is this Muay femur, which is artful, kind of um, e slightly evasive um, style. Not, not powerful. Not powerful, exactly. But you're a very powerful person in a lot of ways. And it was a really kind of evolution of your own identity to discover that Muay Cao is an alternate form of uh, Muay Thai. Well, that it is a form of Muay Thai, like that it's a style to itself. Yeah, but alternate in the sense that it's often put, pitted against, it's the nemesis of Muay Fumur. Yeah, it's the opposite of what I was being told to be. <laughs> yeah, and so there was a discovery that um, Muay Cao and clinch fighting is its own art form. And then the more interesting discovery is you can use it to beat 
really good Muay Thai fighters. Yeah, and bigger fighters. And bigger fighters. So the journey of becoming a clinch fighter has been part also like this journey of discovering this style that's close to an identity for you. Right, and it's a bit like the self-discovery ugly duckling thing where you're like, oh, I'm not a duck. Whereas like yeah, people totally. telling me that I should fight a certain way because of my body size, the frustration with that is because that is not my style. Like it was very hard for me to do that. And my inclination towards being a little fucking tank or whatever, um, discovering that that is a style was was like, crazy oh swans <laughs> oh yeah you're like I think I'm a swan <laughs> totally like a hulk swan <laughs> so um, so in realizing in pursuing this technique uh, and this art form we kind of discovered because of the Muay Thai library mm -hmm. for those that don't know what the Muay Thai library is patrons pledge every month and they get access to a lot of exclusive content but one of the big things the big project is drive Sylvia and us you know driving across Thailand and filming with legends of the sport uh, archiving the techniques of Thailand before they kind of pass out of relevance yeah. and through this you've actually been exposed to an incredible number of high-level masters of clinch fighting and knee fighting and you've kind of developed a library in your own head a knowledge base that I think is unprecedented in the history of the sport just in terms of exposure yeah so there's a kind of challenge like when you're developing a technique usually usually you have one dominant coach so your coach is teaching you his style. If you're in the West, it's maybe even more the case like this. You need to learn your coach's style. A really good coach would be able to like maybe give you versions of his knowledge that would be good for you mm -hmm. and not good for someone else. But very rarely will you be exposed to 20 master level knowledge downloads. Right. So part of the challenge that you've faced is digesting all these influences right. in Muay Cao. Can you talk a little bit about that? About maybe we're talking about your vocabulary increasing, but part of the reason why your vocabulary is increased is that all these years you've been taking on vocabulary. Yeah. Do you not follow me on this? Am I going I, down the wrong road? You need to be more direct in what, what you're asking. Uh, what how I, did Long Sawan, Yodwicha, Karahat, Nam Kabun, like uh, these people literally taught you their... I think of it in terms of dialects, uh -huh. like a language has dialects. Uh -huh. You've learned, you haven't learned Italian, you've learned Italian and 10 dialects in Italian. It, it, it seems like you're not f actually following me along this path. Do you no, want to go some, you, you a different direction? No, because you didn't specify your question. You just specified the okay. generalities about, of the question. But let me just me tell out? you what <laughs> I was thinking, yes. maybe even not even understanding your question. Okay. Um, something that someone, that many people say to me when they're looking at me training with these people is, uh, when you're given different techniques, how do you know which one to do? Like, isn't it confusing to have people tell you different versions of something. Point the toe, don't point the toe. Uh, lean back on the knee, don't lean back on the knee. Um, and I used to say that it's not that hard because it's like remembering not to swear in front of your grandma, but you can cuss with your friends. It's like understanding who you're with kind of thing. So you're saying do whatever the teacher in front of you is telling yeah, you Yeah, so to like do. when you're with Yod Kun Pan, don't lean back. When you're with Karahat, lean the fuck back because that's yeah. his technique. Yeah. But it's more complex than that, and not complex in a difficulty way, complex in a beautiful way, mm. which is, it's not not swearing in front of your grandma because she's going to get mad. It's like, it doesn't fit within the context and program of how you talk to your grandma. Like, you wouldn't yeah. say that fucking guy in front of your grandma because that's yeah. not how you're talking. Like, it's not even what you're talking mm. about. So 
it's not like hard to not lean back on the knee with Yodkun Pan because not leaning back fits into the entire conversation. Like, yeah. I don't accidentally speak English when I'm speaking Thai with Krunu because it doesn't work. Like, it, it doesn't make sense to. Yeah. So you stay in Thai because that's the conversation you're having. that's why I, I compare these, these variations in clinch and Muay Thai fighting and all fighting styles to dialects. Because a dialect is not an independent language, but it's it, it's a whole form of communication that's consistent unto itself. Yep. And in some languages, you can push the dialect so far that uh, people outside of it can't even really follow. Oh yeah. So that's what's kind of interesting is that you've kind of been studying dialects of technique and styles in the Moikau tradition with great variety. Yeah. And you've also been experimenting about how do you stay in a dialect. Right. But there's this new thing that's happening in that I'm able to have these conversations with each trainer or teacher or whatever the thing is. But recently I've been kind of experimenting with the vocabularies from each of those conversations in my own work. And so when I'm clinching at the gym, there are things that don't really fit together. Like you're either a really good lock fighter or a really good long clinch fighter or a really yeah. good don't grab at all and knee from a distance fighter. And yeah. I've been able to start transitioning between them so that I was clinching with Make the other day and I was transitioning between long clinch, lock, long clinch, Banks lock. lock right? And what's beautiful about the two of those together is that the long clinch makes it so that people cannot lock you. That's what my framing does. Mm. And the lock makes it so that people cannot frame or move or do these other things. And so to transition between them, it's being able to shut out your opponent's um, flexibility from two different angles. Well, and just to interrupt real quick, uh, long clinch is was developed with your study of Tanadet uh, up here in Chiang Mai, and there's a Muay Thai library session of that. It's an incredible branch of Muay Thai. And then the lock didn't only come from Bank in Petron Rung, but Bank's uh, uh, Pinu's son, but it was it was founded on your learning it from him. Yeah. And so you started, if I understand it, you started experimenting and moving from Tanadet, a northern, it's a northern style clinch, to Banks like fucking bank, a lock, um, like a safe house lock, an yeah. unmovable kind of freezing of your opponent. Yeah. And the, th the interesting thing to me is, is that Banks a lock fighter, he doesn't do a lot more than that. Tanadet is a long clinch fighter, he doesn't do a lot more than that. But you are, because you're studying in both those styles, you're able to move between them and kind of creatively move between them. Whereas you can build, you can actually build, you can discover what are the natural transition points between a lock fighter and a long clinch fighter. Yeah, it's like kids who are truly bilingual who kind of go back and forth between English and Spanish, like mid-sentence. It's not like I speak English with mom and Spanish with dad. It's totally. like totally blended. And this is what also is interesting to me is in lock fighting, it depends on your opponent, but in lock fighting, you can get to it if you really hit the lock right, you can get to an inescapable spot yeah. where you will just destroy in the round. In long clinch, same thing. Like if you really hit the long clinch in the right way against the right kinds of opponents, you can get to an inescapable position. What's really kind of interesting to me is because in a fight everything is high stress and high tension, it's very hard to hit techniques exact. Like right. you're not going to hit the sweet spot in it, which means that, and sometimes you'll get opponents that can kind of manufacture escapes. But what's really interesting is that 
the lock will be inescapable for five seconds. And then right. it'll start to break down. Right. In This is just reality, like yeah, how it plays out in real fights. There's answers to things. Answer, there's answers, especially if you can't get the exact positioning that you need. And the same thing with the, the same thing with the long clinch, just using those two, exam, two examples. If you are in a lock for four seconds and you, your opponent's working on solving it, you just move to the long clinch and you give them a new puzzle yep. before they break it, break, before they break the code. And as your vocabulary increases, if you're not just moving between lock and long clinch, but you're also doing the arm loop or you're throwing in low clinch or you're throwing in trips, you can keep changing the puzzle before the code is cracked. Yeah. And if you're doing that, the ref can never break it. Yeah. And that's what I see what's been happening in fights recently, is you're moving between puzzles. Yeah, and it's not like a move. Mm -mm. It's... Well, what do you mean by that? It's a good thing to bring up what a move, what is a move? And having why like, is it not a having move? Having like a trip that works most of the time or a lock that gets most people or a face cross that gets you out of most things or mm. that's a move it's mm. like you've got a really fancy vocabulary word that you can pull out and kind of like and conversations with or kind of yeah. like one up people with or appear stilted with or whatever the thing yeah, is the, the yo mama joke that always wins <laughs> <laughs> um but when it's not a move, but rather like actually vocabulary and you're expressing something and moving between things and um, it's it's not like, wow, you pulled out your flare trip. It's like, wow, you kept your opponent off balance for like two minutes. Yeah, and if, so if you're a tripping fighter, it's not uh, a trip, but it's like you're going to have to deal with the fact that I can trip you at any time. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a mode of fighting, which is tripping fighting. If you're a locking fighter, your opponent is like, holy fuck, I gotta stay out of the lock. Yeah. That's can't. why it's not a move. <laughs> That's why it's not a move though, yeah. is because the move actually implies a larger context, a way of, what? That was why I laughed when we were filming with Sifu the other day. Yeah. Um, and he, even or the though, library. Even though yeah. he knows me yeah. quite well, um, but doesn't know my fighting very well at all. Mm -hmm. um, he consistently, because I'm small, again, because you're small, you're supposed to be a certain type of fighter, he's always telling me how to stay out of the clinch. Right. And I'm always like, I'm trying to get into the clinch, like, all the time. Yeah. And so he was saying something about, like, you don't want to lock them because then they can rest. Mm -hmm. And I smiled and I laughed and I'm like, not when I clinch. Yeah. <laughs> like, when... When I get my jaws locked on you, you're not breathing anymore. Like, yeah, that's not, totally. That's not how that works. So. Totally. So this goes to a larger philosophical, well, maybe philosophical, too strong a word, but the difference between a move and the context in which that move gains life. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a struggle that Muay Thai has with its um, exportation to the West and probably Japan and other countries is that much of it is taught by people who are not in the Muay Thai culture. People come to Thailand, study, train, fight. They learn the techniques, but they haven't stayed long enough to absorb the entire style of them. And then they, then it gets exported. They become coaches or trainers to no fight or fault of their own and they have to they teach a simplified move version of it to to students like often to big rooms of students so this so the so the style or the family of of techniques that build a style become extra extracted from yeah well it's i i speak german i went and lived in berlin for about eight months and in that time became fluent but I haven't spoken German in a really long time. Mm -hmm. So when I was fluent in German in an active living, speaking yeah. German every day, I was analogy. actually thinking in German. Yes. I don't think in German anymore. Yeah. So I can still speak German, but it's basically this super limited, pared down, it's like moves. It's like 
Oh, I, I know the word. I know how to that. say that. I know how to say that in German. So I can translate what I'm thinking into German That's a rather very than like thinking in German. Interesting idea. But I'm living in Thailand, so I think in Thai now. Yeah, and also you you've done you've tr done this kind of like clinch immersion. This is like seven years yeah, now. Yeah, so it's thinking in clinch rather yeah. than like what do I do? One hundred percent. And we and I guess what we're talking about is that you've hit a new level of thinking in cl clinch. Maybe it's like now I dream in clinch. Mm. And so I don't know. Can you talk a little bit more about what you think brought on? This shift, this unexpected <laughs> shift, because you've experienced know. a lot of frustration. I don't know. To me, well, I have some ideas. I'll throw them at you. you. Tell me what you think. To me, it was like maybe eight months ago. You can correct me on the time when your main clinch partner partner was Team. Maybe oh was no, a, that was more than a year ago. Okay, more than a year yeah. ago. Team a Thai fighter in um, at Petron Rung, Thai boy stadium fighter. He had just gotten. Strong and big. And too big. And this is what happens is the Thai boys come through, Sylvie clinches with them, and they just outgrow her. And suddenly she's facing somebody who not only is as skilled, if not more skilled, but also physically strong. And yeah. physical big. strength's a big deal in technique because if you don't hit the technique right, you can still muscle the technique if you have the strength to do it. Yeah. So you're tolerant when you're facing someone stronger than you, the tolerances by which you can lose become wide. Mm -hmm. Like your 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 clinch partner doesn't have to hit the right technique in order to overwhelm you. Yeah. And so you the consequence was you got incredibly conservative with your clinch. You became a dead still lock fighter yeah. because you were just trying to survive yeah, against I didn't, a, I didn't want to lose my position. Yeah, so you'd fight for your position and then you'd get a very fucking like pit bull lock on and just hold on for dear life. Yeah, but it's like when you're trying to cross the monkey bars, you have to let go of the last rung to move forward. Otherwise, you're just dangling from the monkey bars. Yeah, but you which could. Is but what you, I was doing because I wouldn't let go. You wouldn't let go. So I was just dangling in the middle of the monkey bars. I was very uh, inactive. And the problem was is that then when you would fight fighters that were bigger than you but not as skilled as you, you had developed this pattern, this habit of locking hard and not moving. Yep. And what was happening was because the, the way that a lot of Thai female fighters fight you is they basically try to neutralize. All right, battery change, as we do. Um, so we were talking about how, like the things that might have led to this sudden vocabulary increase, right? Mm -hmm. Change of partners, you starting to concentrate on fluidity and movement between positions, like not, not getting uh, to your position and just holding but right, surrendering good positions, right? Yeah. I don't think that I was thinking of it like that. I think okay. that I honestly was like, you? just don't lock, like just keep moving. Mm. Um, and because I had a change of partner, because Carabao is not bigger and stronger and better than me, um, I was able to experiment more. So the reason I was able to experiment was because there wasn't so much consequence to taking the risk mm. um, so there were times when like it didn't work <laughs> or I lost my position or you took quite a few photos of me and Carabao in some serious like face smushing yeah, uh, that was one really like, nice one yeah <laughs> clinches um, but that's that's a period of like a year I've been clinching with him Turn right. oh, don't yeah. go right go straight we like that road better okay um and you also had Meg come in, who's like heavier, but much less skilled. Yeah. Right? So, so I still sometimes get thrown from Pinu into training sessions where I'm going against someone who's very big. Like, I still have to work against the bigger Turn right. um, training partner sometimes. But because that's not my only thing, yeah. because I can compare it to other uh, scenarios, and there was a very recent this was actually right before my like breakthrough sorry I'm gonna do this oh good 
this was right before my recent breakthrough uh, where like I went and fought and trot and that was where we were like holy shit Sylvie's clinch vocabulary just shot up shot up yeah was I was man in the middle which is a way of clinching where one person stays it all the time and when someone gets dominated or thrown down or whatever a fresh person comes in all the time so that's when you switch partners is when something happens so you're always working towards these big moments but when they're but when they happen a fresh partner comes a fresh partner so, comes so, so, really so <laughs> there is some consideration where you're like Carabao is harder to clinch than make so I'm not going to throw make right away yeah yeah <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah yeah I'm going to work and on some this some of the time boys get absurd about this <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would be man in the middle with um, sometimes three partners but Pinu was having me go against um, a Swedish woman who's much bigger than me and strong but not super skilled so beyond this is outside of Thai boys that this you is usually, really recent yeah um, and then he would have me either have the second person be another person who is bigger than me or possibly uh, care about who I can do a lot more experimentation with so it's moving between like experimentation heavy load experimentation heavy load or like two heavy loads how do you deal with that and i think that that that's not variety just heavy load heavy load heavy the two load. of them is yeah but because you don't want to exhaust yourself you can't go heavy against heavy mm. you can't do it if you have one that's heavy and one that's skill you can be like when i'm going against the heavy one i use strength when i'm going against the skill one i go a little bit whatever when it's like when it's heavy and heavy, you can't be strong all the time. You fucking fall apart. It's like holding the dictionary up. Yeah. Um, and so it actually forces you into relying more on technique, which I didn't do before. I would just use strength against strength all the time. Um, so I think that that expanded my access to my vocabulary very recently. But because all that other work had come before it, like being able to clinch with someone who wasn't scaring me and being so strong that I had to stay clung to the ring all the time. Totally. Um, boy, I lost my train of thought there. Something more than just clinching with two big Western girls has happened here, though. Like I didn't say that's what it was. I was saying yeah. that right before the breakthrough and all the things that led into that moment... I was forced to expand my vocabulary because of the exercises that Krenu was putting me in. What came to my mind when you were talking about heavy versus heavy, or being strong on strong, is this little thing that happened in your last fight. We're driving back, Sylvie just won a world title uh, versus uh, Nong Benz, giving up a ton of weight. This is the little thing that happened in that fight you told me about, where Pinu is telling you to like, leverage out your elbow when yep. you're in the frame yep. and you're scarecrowing somebody yep. Wait, talk a little bit because that's about not using or using technique against strength yeah so like when you have the inside position and someone wraps their arm around the outside of your arm and is like pushing your face or something if they're taller or bigger or strong because you're already in this position you don't have a lot of strength to get out of that position mm. and so he was teaching me kind of pressure points or ways to lock out their ability to get a really good grip so for example when someone tries to grab your neck if you close your neck they can't get the perfect grip right. before they get the grip you do this or um, if you uh, keep your elbow on the front of someone's chest you always have this little door jam to create space whereas if you go over their shoulder you can't create space anymore okay so this is like those little what was techniques it? which is that when you're locked here and they're coming over you and pushing you you've lost your strength so you use your elbow on the inside of their arm to kind of pressure it out and it makes them lose a bit of their strength so that you can then move right so when I was uh, clinching Nong Benz in this fight, we were in that position, and I could not get the arm loop, which well, I have to have freedom in my arm in order to... Well, it's not that position because you're trying to go outside. That position is inside. No, it is that position because yeah. when you're inside, you're trying to go outside, uh, but if they're locked over your arm, uh, you can't come out. Uh, so you have to create freedom for that. And there was this moment 
that people who do BJJ will understand, which is using patience to get where you want to go. You cannot use constant pressure, you tire yourself out. But the same way that she was using strength to lock my ability to come out, mm. you can't keep using strength like that. Yeah. You can't hold that position forever. Yeah. And I'm so fucking strong. And I'm like, I'm just going to wait you out. I'm going to put a little bit of pressure right here on the window yeah. and wait for it to And this shatter. was on an arm loop, right? Like I needed to arm loop her, but yeah, I couldn't because I was like this. I have a photograph still from this moment in the fight. Well, that was a beautiful thing. We were filming yesterday. And Krucha, when he was watching that Instagram, it starts with me, with my arm like this. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 you should have your arm over like this. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, wait. You said that to him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see the, you see the like pressure and then the like weight coming down to fold it down. Turn right. And part of the, um, part of the thing about what Krunu has worked with me on in that is he's so big he's so much bigger than me and he's really long and he's really skilled and he knows how to like frustrate just punches me in the face from like three feet away yeah but stuff. It's not that sounds untechnical his his frustrations are very technical very technical like, like he's and long I, and, and I'm technical I'm getting yeah. frustrated because yeah. I know what he wants me to do and I cannot do it yeah and I got kind of frustrated and I was like what do I do to him and he's like you, you can't I'm just too big and what he was teaching me was be patient. Mm. Like, I'm too big and strong. You may not be able to do the move you want to do. Stop trying to do a move. Like, find your way there. Yeah, it's, it's the feeling. Like, this is the thing. It's like, a move would be arm loop. Yes. The feeling is, how do you get to the arm loop from where you are? And this is why Muay Thai clinch is like a full-on martial art to itself. It's standing BJJ. Because there's feelings on how to get from positions to positions. The transitions are where the art is and where yeah. the feeling is. Yeah. And six months ago, you could have never gotten to that arm loop. No. And if you hadn't gone to the arm loop, you knocked her out five seconds later yep. with the knee on the other side. Yep. The entire knockout would have been impossible for you just because you didn't have the feeling. Yeah. And it's really interesting that the feeling is starting to grow. Something that might have started with um, the filmages of um, the inner game of tennis reading group we did eight months ago or whatever that was. This philosophy of moving towards the feeling. But that was really cool that there was this decisive moment in the fight where you were kind of in a slightly inferior position and you just had the patience to slowly transition out against strength. Yeah. Even though you're a strong fighter, you're like, I know you can't hold that position. Yeah. And it's like, oh, there's something so unbelievably cool about that. And then, I don't want to uh, go too far in this one direction, but this is something that very, I don't know how you even feel about this, but there's something very special about your path as a Muay Thai fighter that for a long time you wanted to be good which was just have nice looking Muay Thai like as many people do and instead you found yourself on this clinch Muay Cao style and you're exposed yourself to so much vocabulary a library of techniques I don't know that there's a fighter in the history of Muay Thai Thai or Western who's been exposed to this much high-level knowledge. Because the way you learn stuff in Thailand, like if you're a Thai fighter, is you're taught within your gym. There might be like three technique families in your gym. And then you pick up on one, and you like that one, and you develop that one, and you're, you steal from your sparring partners a little bit. But you're exposed to a pretty narrow though elevated family of techniques mm. because of the uniqueness of the Muay Thai library you've been exposed to like 20 like complete styles yeah. and I don't know that there's ever been a fighter who has had that kind of depth of exposure and 
you now have an encyclopedic brain where it's like, oh, face smush. There's five ways to face smush. Yeah. There's five angles to put your shoulder at. Should you stand up? Should you pull away? Like, Sancti Noi does it this way. Karahat does it this way. Like, to see these variations makes you be able to see into the, the nature of the technique. Yeah. And all of them are right. Yeah, and they also have variation. It's like Karahat tends to do it this way, but he'll mm. adjust if he needs to kind of thing. Them, which goes or, back to or feeling. Or because he's bored, he'll just change it. Totally. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is that you're, you now have the opportunity to like explore, especially since you're moving towards feeling now, a really big, this is why we talk about like Rosetta Stone, um, library of techniques. Mm. Well, does this not interest you? I agree with you. Okay. But you don't just read a book and that's everything you've learned from it. You learn it like four years later when you're like, oh man, I totally need to read that again because I feel like I understand it differently. Like it kind of sticks in your mind. Well, tell me about this analogy. We had a little bit of this discussion before we started the camera. The Nabokov of vocabulary. Like we compared some of these decisions to Nabokov, one of your favorite authors. Yeah. The thing about Nabokov that's just... If for people who don't know Nabokov. So fucking unfair. Okay. Everyone knows him as the man who wrote Lolita. Well, not everyone, but many Anyone people. who knows his name knows yeah. him as the man who wrote Lolita. Yeah. But he has many incredible, incredible books. He's Russian. First language is Russian, but he speaks like five or seven or something. I think French was a very powerful language for him when he was growing up. But what's insane is he's as poetically gifted and versatile in all of them. Like, English is my first language, and I wish I spoke it as well as Nabokov does, or wrote it as well as Nabokov does. And I have a good vocabulary. Like, I am a good writer. But well, he does this thing when he's writing where he'll choose the word from any of those five languages because that's the one that really pulls the connotations and feelings of what he's I mean, trying to get. I mean, to be get. clear, he's writing in English. He's writing in English, yeah. but then he'll just use a French word out of nowhere. Right. And if you don't know the word, you kind of know the word from the context. Mm. Like when I was reading Ada, mm. he totally pulls in French words all the time. I don't speak French at all. Yeah. And a lot of them don't have roots but that I'm familiar it. with. Yeah. But I'm like, I totally get not the denotation of that word. I don't know literally what that means, but I get the feeling of what he's pulling in. But it's not only that. It's not like, oh, he throws in all these language words. His sensitivity to language, because he has that sensitivity in many languages, makes him an unparalleled writer in English. Yes. Like, the way he uses English words is unreal. Yeah. Like, oh my God, my own language can do that. Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. And that's kind of what is really interesting about this Moikau development is that Moikau is thought of often as a kind of like march forward, grab, knee, power fighting. Yeah. But it really has incredible subtlety in it. Yeah. If you come at it with a large vocabulary. Yeah. You can fight Moy Cow, grab, knee, cardio out somebody. You can fight that way. But like this thing you were talking about where you just put a little pressure on her arm and waited for her strength position to decay. Yeah. Which led to a knockout. That's fucking unreal. That to me, that's we're talking about this Nabokov kind of concept yeah. of being able to use English, which is thought of often in the world in the family of languages as kind of like a working language, mm -hmm. like very functional, yeah. but lacking in subtleties sometimes. But to be able to use it with great subtlety, that's what Nabokov is kind of like. And I feel like you are heading towards this kind of Nabokovian thing if you continue to be able to open your pathway 
which is kind of like, and then what's interesting about it is I don't know of any fighter in the history of Muay Thai, and maybe there's some slick Isan fighters where this has been the case. Any fighter in the history of Muay Thai that has used clinch to defeat much, much larger opponents over and over and over again. Clinch is a, usually a power attack. It's not often used by smaller opponents. You are doing this thing. We had that cool experience of watching, I think it was that Pride documentary. Yeah, I think it was one of, really about one of the Gracies. Oh, yeah, well, Gracie documentary. There was a little, the little Japanese guy that fucking uses heel hooks to destroy and defeat giant opponents. Yeah, he was in this tournament. I'm sure people watching this are like, oh, that's blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're able to use techniques to defeat larger opponents, you really are exposing the art of it. Yeah. And that's what's happening in your career path because you're only going to be fighting bigger and bigger opponents and you're having to learn to use the vocabulary of Muay Thai to defeat somebody with a significant size geometry advantage on you. Right, which for a very long time has actually been very limiting to me. So for it to How be... How do you mean? I'm not following. My Muay Thai, because I fight people who are so much bigger, is limited by the fact that they're so much bigger. Mm. I get... The things you can't do. You... Angered yeah. by comments I get from people who have never faced someone bigger than themselves ever being like, I don't get what you're trying to do in this fight. And it's yeah. like, yeah, you wouldn't because yeah. you're fucking limited by someone having that much range and size on you. Yeah. So yeah, I would love to be able to do kicks and like, uh, you know, kind of more finessed movement Why would moves. you love to do that? I would love to have that in my vocabulary. I don't want to mm. be that fighter, but yeah. it's the same thing where like Bank is incredibly strong, but when he does Karahat's flip down, that's mm. not a power move, you're like, holy shit, did he just say parlay? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just spoke French all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, kind of amazing. So, one last little bit on this. How much time we got on this? Seven minutes. Okay. One last little bit that I think has really big, been a huge impact on really why you've had an explosion. Well, I'll call it an explosion because I, I'm a dude. Uh -huh. Everything explodes. The Michael Bay. Explosions. Of the Michael Bay version. Michael Bay analogy. The explosion of vocabulary is the work you've been doing in Vipassana, which is very an hour a day, sometimes two hours a day. Um, you've been on several retreats, but this seriousness with which you've kind of like moved your mind towards a much more flexible, open state that is in contrast to the pressures you feel for, for performance. Yeah. And the fact that every day you're stretching your mind out to these like to, for people don't know Vipassana is not about like chilling out it's not a tranquility it's not a tranquility meditation it's not even a calmness <laughs> <laughs> it's growing the awareness of your body right and mind yeah there's something about that I, I liken it to when, when you're under tension or in your in your everyday states of mind you have a diameter, like your pipe has a very small diameter, and there's only so much water that can flow through that. When you are, when you are moving towards your Vipassana states, your pipe has a very wide diameter, and more water can flow through that. And I feel like that's the same thing that's happening with your techniques, is somehow the diameter has changed. It, yeah, can you talk about that at all for me? Or you don't really connect it? I don't connect to it, but what, to me, the relief or freedoms that I've gotten from Vipassana is not resisting states so much. So a lot of people, when they're trying to meditate, will get really frustrated when their mind wanders because it's not focused and when you're meditating, you're supposed to be focused and tranquil and all these things, but Vipassana teaches you that the mind wandering is a natural state for the mind to mm. be in. The mm. mind wanders, that's what it does. It's like right. being angry that you're tired, like the body gets tired, that's what it does, and so you sleep. Right. But I think that I get really frustrated in Muay Thai because 
my body is doing or my mind is doing things that Vipassana has taught me are natural states. And because nothing can stay the same forever, nothing, mm-hmm. it's like, just pull the mind back. Mm-hmm. It's wandering, just pull it back. That's not what we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. Instead of like, God, it's fucking wandering again. And like, then you're on this whole It's like a balloon that it. drifts off though, right? Like you, you've come, pull you, you pull it. So can you not see how this maybe would connect up with increasing your vocabulary and your in your technique thing because, because it's not you just get stuck on things where like this <laughs> move isn't working and you're like oh my god this move worked against someone bigger than this person why is it not working here uh, yeah and it's like not working is a natural state for things to be <laughs> things don't work totally and then they're going to work later or you move to the next thing or it's like okay i'm not going to be able to arm hook this person yeah, you uh, talk about this sometimes when you come home. You're like, oh, I was totally getting this great lock on make, but I can't. I wasn't locking it on. I can't do it on Carabao. Carabao. He's taller, thinner. And I can't get my fucking head under Carabao's head because he's so tall. Right? And it's like getting the head under is such an amazing thing. But it's the same thing with Vipassana. Like, I would love to wake up and have a super, like, I'm, I'm having a very easy time focusing on the now and the present moment of what position the body is in, what the mind is doing, and like, oh, that's very easy. But then you're just going through a routine. You're not actually looking at what's happening. You're supposed to be observing what's actually happening. So to have the opportunity to practice Vipassana when you're angry, Mm. when you're frustrated, when you're tired, when you actually don't want to be sitting there, like all of these different things teaches you way more about the uh expansive possibilities in which you can pull it back to that's perfect and it's very cool that part of technique is technique not working like nobody (laughs) thinks that nobody thinks that though everybody's like the technique is this beautiful hip turn kick right you're always moving towards the perfection right like you can't you can't turn your leg on your hook because then people can leg kick you (laughs) But people can still leg kick you if you don't turn your foot on them. <laughs> like, you can still get leg kicked. I know, that's one of our favorite pet peeves about this don't pivot that lead leg. It's so ridiculous. Um, and then, what are we at? We're in two minutes. Can you real quick throw in this? I really want to get this little technical thing, how you were moving between the long clinch and the and the lock with Banks lock and, and Tanadet. That experience of like how you were figuring out the root of a technique. Do you remember when we were talking about that? No. You were saying, I understand the root of it. So that... Well, anyways, talk about how you were moving, how these are two complementary things. I was clinching with Meg, who is... Outweighs me by, like, 10 kilos or more, maybe. Um, but he's short and pudgy and not super strong. Um, so he can use power on me and weight on me at times... Uh, which makes the risk real in the things that I'm working on. Um, but it's not scary to the point where I like won't risk it for the consequence or whatever. And with him, I was, I I didn't even like decide to do it. I just started transitioning between Banks lock, which is very tight. And then the long guard, which is also very tight, but very like expanded out so it's like this accordion kind of thing going on and um i was clinching with him for about 15 or 20 minutes straight before pinu saved him by giving me carabao as another person so that i was man in the middle um but i think in all that time he threw like one knee because he just could not with this constant expansion contraction expansion Mm -hmm. contraction he was so disoriented and frustrated and lost in the like i don't know what to do in either state like if you stay in one people can solve it eventually but if you keep if you keep moving it's like i can't target like i can't see where you are what's so cool about this is that people know that in in range control in fighting in space this is what you do you change range yeah you you have close range weapons like hooks or elbows or knees and then long range weapons teeps head kicks and whatnot and then as you change if you can change range as a in space fighter you're hard to deal with because the target is 
never where it quite was. Yeah. Where it was five seconds before. Time is up. It's okay. We have one more minute. Okay. The, the same thing happens in clinch. Yep. Yeah. That you can accordion out space in clinch and be unsolvable. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what's exciting to me is that you're also developing these like spatial freedoms that come in the with the territory of those dialectics. As if, I don't know. I'm very excited by this. Um, it feels like a new landscape is kind of opening up for you. And so what we're doing is we're training with Tanadet every month when we go up to Chiang Mai to keep the long clinch um, dialectic going. We're training with Karahat every month because he has this, this beautiful shouldery, slippery clinch style that also pull, has a great waist throw, right? And then Diesel Noy will be back in the gym fucking teaching you knee shredding <laughs> right. so it's kind of exciting okay let's stop this thing and see go to the next one